Oh, hello! My name is Mara, and welcome to Books Like Woe. Guys, I am so excited because we have finally reached that special point in Project Pora where we are talking about the inimitable Murder on the Orient Express. This is probably Agatha Christie's best known book, that and and then there were none, they kind of duke it out, but this is certainly the best known of the Hercule Poirot books, and this is the ninth installment in my Project Poirot, which I'll have the rest of them linked somewhere, but basically I am reading all of the Hercule Poirot novels in order, and I didn't really think this all the way through when I first started the project, but I'm so excited about the timing of getting to this particular book because there is about to be a major motion picture release of this book coming out in I want to say it's the very beginning of November so in a couple of weeks there's gonna be a huge adaptation of this of this particular work I'm also just a huge fan of the original movie adaptation of this book so you'll be seeing a couple of sort of comparison videos on this channel between this book the original movie and the new movie talking about kind of where they all stack up but in the meantime I want wanted to talk about my thoughts about my reread of this book, which I, I'm gonna be honest, I was a little trepidatious about because I remember loving this book. Like I've read it several times, but it had been a couple of years since I'd reread it. And sometimes you're just not sure if something is going to live up to your memory of it as well as sort of like the reality. Do you know what I mean? Like you'll go back and reread something and think, huh, I don't know why I love this so much, but I am very, very happy to report that in this particular case, the book more than holds up. In fact, I actually think I like it better now than when I had previously reread it. So let's get into this. And if you never watched one of my Project Poirot review things, just a couple of housekeeping items. One, there's no spoilers here, so if you have not yet read this book or seen the movie, no worries, you can still watch this because I'm not going to get into any specific spoilers. And also, one of the things that I'm sort of looking at as I'm reading these books is sort of how they reflect their sort of historical moment and specifically talking about the kind of evolution of social mores and sort of moral thoughts about like morality basically in Agatha Christie's work so I'll have a couple of thoughts about that as well after I get into the main summary so let's jump into that right now so murder on the Orient Express takes place on you guessed it the Orient Express now what was that that was basically a train service that ran from basically like Istanbul to Calais. So if you're thinking about that on a map that goes basically from Turkey to the north of France, and this was sort of a luxury train that allowed people to get from England all the way to the Middle East, and it became sort of famous because it was, you know, like it, it essentially became quite iconic, and I think this book kind of helped do that, but it also, when I think of the Orient Express, you should think sort of like early modern traveling luxury. So anyway, Anyway, Poirot has been helping on a case with the French army in Syria, and he is going to be taking the Orient Express back from Istanbul to England, basically, until he gets called to immediately come back to Britain. So he'd been kind of thinking he was going to sort of take his time and see Istanbul, but he gets a kind of an emergency wire. And a good friend of his is actually the owner of the Wagon Lee trains, which is what the Orient Express is, and he says, okay, don't worry, I can get you on a express tonight. Now they didn't think that this is going to be a problem because he's traveling in the winter and that's usually not a time where a lot of people are traveling but lo and behold when he gets to the station it is completely full so his friend pulls some strings and gets him on the train and the train is full of a lot of different interesting characters. Mary Debenham and Colonel Abernathy. There's also a count and a countess who are Hungarian. There's an old kind of weird draconian Russian princess who's on the train with her servant, crazy American lady who won't shut up about her kids. But probably the most important person we need to know about aside from Hercule Poirot is Mr. Ratchet. Now he's an American rich dude basically and Poirot basically doesn't like the look of him as soon as he sees him but he's traveling with a valet butler guy and his secretary and he actually ends up approaching Poirot on their I think first night on the train and says hey somebody like I have a case for you somebody's threatening my life I'd like you to investigate it and Poirot basically 
basically gives him the brush off and says, look, dude, I'm at a point in my career where I don't have to take cases I don't want. I don't want to take your case. And amazingly, when he, <laughs> when Mr. Ratchet asks Poirot why he doesn't want to take his case, Poirot straight up looks him in the eye and is like, I do not like the look of your face, which was a sick burn and I, I got a good little chuckle out of that, so way to go, Hercule. However, unfortunately, the train is making its way uh, kind of through Eastern Europe and there's a ton of snow and they get caught in a snowstorm one night and they're stuck there. And come to find out the next morning, guess who's dead? Mr. Ratchet, just as he had kind of feared. So Poirot doesn't, I mean, he still doesn't like the look of his face, but he feels, you know, his friend is the owner of the train and this guy had kind of come to him for help and he denied it. So he said, okay, you know, I want to figure out exactly who done it. In the middle of this snowstorm, is it somebody on the train? Is it somebody who got on and got off? What's going on? And the story really progresses from there. I don't want to give away anything more because I really, I just highly recommend this book in case you can't tell yet. And I really would love people to read it even before they saw the movie. I don't want to give away anything more, but what I will say is that upon rereading this, I, I'm just convinced that this is the best book she ever wrote. I mean, I'm gonna, I don't want to give away my final rankings, but in terms of like novel, this is absolutely the best novel she ever wrote, in my opinion, and that is for a number of reasons. Well, first, I want to talk about how this book is sort of a development on some of the ones we've talked about previously in this project. So first of all, we have A Murder on a Train again, just like in The Mystery of the Blue Train. Now that's a book that we know that I did not like, but I think that this particular book corrects a lot of the things that I didn't like in The Mystery of the Blue Train. This book addresses those things, and I know that The Mystery of the Blue Train was what Agatha Christie thought was the worst book she ever wrote. So I almost wonder if this book is meant to be sort of like a redo of that one and doing it the right way because she does the things that I hated in that book, she corrects in this one. Primarily that I felt like in The Mystery of the Blue Train, she just had too big of a cast who did not have enough kind of direct involvement in the mystery. So their existence in the book felt, felt very superfluous. Whereas in this book, there is a very large cast of characters, right? So I think that there's got to be something like 16 to 18 people that we're kind of keeping track of. However, she does a masterful job of sort of coordinating them, making each of them interesting, but also making each of them involved in the mystery to some degree and viable suspects. And this is something that we saw in the last book that we talked about, Lord Edgeware Dies. She's continuing that theme of she has a large cast, but she's made each of their psychology quite interesting and in that that psychology is a huge part of solving the mystery, right? Because Paro doesn't have a lot of like fancy things that he can do. He's stuck in the middle of nowhere and he doesn't have access to like interview people who know them or to like do any sort of like forensic stuff really. I mean, he does one basic little thing, but basically he is having to sort of just deduce and figure out who's telling him the truth and who's lying to him. And that really is where Agatha Christie shines, I feel like. I think when she gets into too many details in terms of trying to make the logistics of the crime really clever, I think sometimes she can get a little bit lost. So the fact that this is sort of a pared down mystery where really what we're doing is figuring out timeline and who's lying and who's telling the truth, I think that that plays to her strengths and that is part of why this is such a successful book. I also think that she makes the kind of motivation for the crime very compelling and I think that makes a very interesting read in terms of engagement for the reader because you feel very conflicted about the murder uh, itself in terms of who the victim is because he's not likable like the more you find out about Mr. Ratchet the more you understand why Poirot didn't like his face he's like a shitty human being basically so I think that adds a layer of sort of dissonance with the reader where we're sort of like I really like all these other people and if one of them did it I'm gonna be sad so I kind of hope that maybe it's an outsider or whatever because I don't like this guy I'm kind of glad he's dead so I think she's playing on a lot of levels in terms of motivations and sort of making the reader complicit and may potentially wanting murderers to get away with what they did. I think that that also adds an interesting layer here. I was also really struck by the character of Mary Debenham in this particular reread. Now she's one that I had certainly noticed in previous rereads. I mean, I think she's one of the more fleshed out characters, but it really, just because I've been reading these in their order of publication, it really struck me that she is a very specific type of person person in Christie books. Almost every single Christie novel, now that I'm kind of thinking about it this way, has a, a young woman of her type who is very competent, very
very compelling and has a lot of interesting kind of psychology going on. She's often in some sort of like imperiled situation in terms of her finances, or she's somebody who's had to sort of be self-made or figure kind of figure her way out in the world. And sometimes she's the murderer, sometimes she's not, but she's she's a very specific type in Christie books and she's almost always the most interesting person in one of these novels. And it's sort of known that there's an Agatha Christie stand-in in her Poirot world, Ariadne Oliver. She's an older writer who's gonna show up at some point and that's often who we sort of think of as being the Agatha Christie stand-in. But I am, this book kind of made me wonder if the Mary Debenham type Type, the this type of person who we see up see show up in a lot of Christie novels. I kind of wonder if she's actually who Agatha Christie is, is identifying with in these books because there's a lot of kind of care given to her development. Another thing that I've been noticing the more I've been reading these in order is that there is a lot of older guys hooking up with young women. So there's sort of an implied love connection between Mary Debenham and Colonel Abernathy. And Colonel Abernathy is like straight up in his 40s and like mid 40s. And I think Mary Debenham is described as being like 28 and this happens a lot and I mean I'm wondering if it's somewhat having to do with the time period and I don't know it's just sort of weird it's this there seems to be the attitude of the author that like mid 40s is sort of prime time for a man to get married and that just seems sort of odd to me keep in mind that Agatha Christie by this point was married to a man who I think was like 20 years younger than her so I wonder if that plays into it in terms of sort of the overall things that we've been doing with the project though some interesting things that are continuing on is xenophobia again so there's a lot of comments about Poro. Poro is essentially not taken seriously at first by any of the passengers because he's French and this is most explicitly kind of expressed by the British passengers but he's sort of dismissed as being like you know this little French even though he's Belgian sort of like French frippery who you don't really have to worry about and there's a lot of sort of discussions of the foreigner being suspect by the British and American characters. I was also interested to note that the ugly American trope was apparently alive and well when this was published in I think 1934 because Mrs. Hubbard, who's sort of the loud annoying American woman who won't shut up about her kids, is definitely explicitly described the same way that I would expect someone to be describing an ugly American abroad now. Like she's always complaining that people won't take her money or that like the kind of amenities that she can get in the US aren't available in foreign countries. So I was just intrigued to see that that kind of stereotype has existed for so long. And you know, a little ashamed of my fellow my fellow Americans that we have had such a bad reputation abroad for so long. And one final note on sort of like foreign relations, whatever. There's, there's sort of a flip side of things happening. So on the one hand, there's a lot of positive comments about how on a train, it's one of the only places where you see so many people from so many countries, so many backgrounds, so many nationalities, so many classes, all kind of thrown together into one small space. And I think that's commented on positively in the sense of it seems that this train is able to do something that we can't do in broader society. I, I think that Christie is kind of positive about that. But on the flip side, there's also a lot of discussion, a very patronizing discussion about like civilizing the East and that doesn't date particularly well. But I did think it was intriguing that even in the 30s, there's sort of this, and we've talked a little bit about this in the wake of World War One, some of these books, but this growing sense of globalism. And I think that there's some fear that goes along with that, right? Like I think that there's moments in Agatha Christie's work where the kind of fear of globalism is, is a little bit of the motivation of some of the plot stuff. But in this particular book, I think we're seeing that that element of globalism being portrayed positively, that as we grow more connected through technologies like train travel and eventually airplane travel, things like that, the world is getting smaller and that that is seen as something more or less positive. And finally, our ongoing theme here in Project Poirot is what you see isn't always the truth. So that again is really what I think thematically is happening here in this book as it is with most mysteries, but I think that Agatha Christie is playing with that sort of moral lesson in a very interesting way in this book. And I think particularly because Poirot really does have to use his little gray cells to dissect what is the truth with very little to go on. I think you really, there's a lot being kind of said implicitly about how people who appear to be one way may not be. 
be it because they are hiding something, be it because they of their profession, whatever, they that you can't take people at face value and that you always need to kind of ask yourself why you're perceiving someone a certain way and that, yeah, basically just kind of urging the reader to self-reflection in the context of a mystery, then in theory also should encourage them to do that in the context of their own lives. So to sum up my feelings about this, I, again, I was just, I was almost surprised at how much I loved this, even though I know that this is one of her best books. I know that it's one that's great for people to start with. I, I just, I really enjoyed this in a fresh way that I wasn't sure if I would or not just because I have read it several times before but I had such an appreciation for sort of the craftsmanship of this novel I think once you know the solution looking at some of the dialogue throughout the book becomes quite interesting and I, I just enjoyed the hell out of this so where would I rank this well in terms of ratings I gave this a five stars again on Goodreads. This is what I'd given it previously, but I would give this a full seven out of seven unicorns because it is one of, it, I think I can now safely say, it is my favorite Christie novel. I'm going to put it below, I'm going to put it below Poirot Investigate just because I really do have such a soft spot for Agatha Christie short stories and I really enjoyed those, but I'm going to say that it beats The Mysterious Affair at Styles, which I would not have said previously. I, I just really, really appreciated this book, enjoyed it. I think it works on both a literary level in terms of innovation in the mystery genre and really playing on some of the classic tropes of sort of a locked room mystery and a secluded house type mystery trope because they're all secluded onto this little train stuck in a snowstorm. So I think it's playing on a lot of those genre things and making innovations in an important way. But then just as a reader, as any reader, I think if you like mysteries, you'll probably enjoy this book. So I completely recommend it. I completely enjoyed it. And I'm really, really glad that that has been the case because you just never know when you get into a reread how you're going to feel the next time around. So I think that does it for this installment of Project Poirot. As I said, I'm going to be doing more with this particular book just because there is a big film release of it coming up soon. So I'm going to be doing some kind of movie book comparisons over the next few weeks and I just enjoy the hell out of this particular book and I, I'm excited. I'm hoping that people will see the movie and get excited about Agatha Christie afresh because I really think that her work holds up pretty well considering it's coming up on 100 years old. I feel like her books have aged very well and there's so many of them so if you enjoy mysteries there's just a lot for you to get into. So stay tuned here and also I hope that if you've never read any Christie that this book might potentially kind of really get you in the mood for her. So I think that that will do it. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social medias if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description. And if you've read this book before or you're planning to read it, I'd love to know your thoughts because I clearly loved it. But uh, you know, not every book can work for every reader. So would love to hear your thoughts, positive or negative. And I think that that will do it. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day and I will just talk to you soon. Bye.